Mark Reckless. Uh, it's a pleasure to follow my honourable friend for Warrington South. I was very impressed with his speech and what he said about the growing disconnect between this country and most other countries in the world on this issue. I also have to say, with the exception of himself and the right on, my right honourable friend for, for Wokingham, there seems to be a, an enormous disconnect between what happens in this House and where our constituents are on this issue. Our constituents want to see cheap, reliable energy. And if we listened to proceedings on, on Monday, we saw, that, saw the government looking, looking around for various measures to, to, to try and understand to, to cut or at least to reduce the rise in electricity bills by £50. And purportedly from the other side as, uh, as well, the debate is about trying to cut bills or hold them down. And they say for 20 months from May 2015, they will apparently fix prices. But the reality is the opposition are cooperating with our front bench and with the Liberal Democrat Party to fix prices for 20 or 30 years across vast swathes of our electricity generation capacity and to fix prices at two or three times the current market truck price, driving costs through the roof for our constituents who are going to be forced to pay these prices for decades to come. And yet they purport to be having a debate about holding prices down, when the reality is the reverse. And we see that again today in this rather surreal debate as to whether we should just you know, force some of the cheap generation to close like the government supports, or support even more of it to close like the opposition want. I will. Very grateful. And has he noticed that uh, the big industrial powers who are serious about industry, Germany and China, are adding coal capacity, and America is going for shale gas, and they'll take the industry and we'll lose it? My, um, my uh, right honourable friend is, is quite correct, and we, we, we learn, I, I, I think, that the, the industry at Grangemouth, that the, the, the friends of their opposition and their funders in the unions almost shut down, there is a chance it might stay open or even possibly make money, but that would only be on the basis of importing shale gas from the United States, when we've had this preposterous arrangement where we've stopped <coughs> shale gas development for a moratorium for an extraordinarily long period because of a couple of tiny, tiny tremors near Blackpool. If we are serious about a country pushing ahead economically, we have to generate better energy more cheaply and we have to do that quickly, where we are entailed in a Dutch auction between the parties in doing completely the reverse. And this coal, these coal plants and what we see of this amendment 105 from, 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 from the Lords is just an example in point. We have the European Union closing down many or most of our coal plants and the parties going along with that. But in addition, we are unilaterally indulging this self-flagellation of preventing new coal fire power stations being constructed through this emissions performance standard, which we've decided to impose as a unilateral burden on UK business, while the Germans allow the construction of new coal and, of course, countries outside the European Union produce power more cheaply. And what we see today is an attempt by the opposition and the other place to make it even worse. We've got this current situation where the EU are, 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 are shutting many of the existing plants. We're banning the construction of new ones. And what the opposition wants to do is bring in a, bring a, bring a third deleterious thing to extend that ban on coal to part of the plants that the EU would allow to remain open if people spend vast amounts of money to comply with the Industrial Emissions Directive. If they do that, the party opposite, Labour, the other place, what they want to do is say, ah, well, e if you spend that money, we're going to put this additional burden where supposedly you'll fit this pie-in-the-sky CCS, which is nowhere near to sensible commercial development in the UK, or in reality we will force you to close down and drive up the price of electricity even further. Now, in what seemed almost uh, one of his more sensible points, the Honourable Member for Rather Glen and Hamilton West suggested that pricing in electricity depended on the, the, the gas, and uh, I, I take that point to a degree. As an economist, I understand that in a competitive market, which I fear this increasingly is not, uh, marginal cost tends to equal price. But what has actually happened is there's a difference between the gas that's already there, where the development costs, the capital costs are sunk, and in terms of marginal costs being set to price should be discounted for a, a, a rational person in a competitive market, and new gas, which isn't coming on, on stream. 
And partly it's not coming in stream because the minister has, has told them, ah, well, if you bring it on stream, we'll give you a great subsidy as long as you don't bring it on now and wait for a few years. I mean, even, the, even, even Chris Hoot, who at least as an economist thought that was madness, yet now we are pushing that forward and the capacity market is stopping capacity coming on stream for that key period of that few years. And it is a key period because we're looking at this increasing crunch. And DEC tells us, oh, well, it's run these scenarios with Ofgem and what's happening is that it, they, 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 they've looked at what would happen if uh, demand is a bit greater for electricity than they assume. They, they assume energy demand is going to fall, but they say, oh, well, well, look at this. Look, look at the sensitivity. Let's run a scenario where it doesn't fall. But actually all they're doing is just keeping demand flat. What happens if actually due to the success of the policies of this coalition and what the Chancellor is doing and what we're seeing in terms of the resurgence of growth in the British economy, if actually we see energy demand increase? I dread to think in terms of the preparations or lack of them or where they are, extraordinarily expensive preparations which are being put in place. And at the same time, we are proposing to cut these coal-fired plants, many of whom completely depreciated in terms of the capital who are producing electricity reasonably cheaply, and we are banning them either nationally and unilaterally or through our acquiescence in what the European Union is doing. Now, the Honourable Member for Rutherford Glen and Hamilton West, he identified, I think, three sets of coal plants. And if I, if I understood him correctly, I think he's missed out on a fourth category. Uh, and that is those coal plants where the issue is not the industrial emissions directive, but the large combustion plants directive, where there are hours expired under that, but are still there and could still potentially be brought back on stream to generate cheap and reliable electricity for our constituents. However, they won't let them. Our side won't let them either. Even the European Union has within that large combustion plants directive a section 3.4, which provides for the potential of a member state to apply for a derogation, particularly when their plans to arrange for sufficient capacity in the, in the energy market are, are not working as they had hoped. What, what better case have we got to do that? And I don't say to keep them open forever. I mean, I go around Kings North in my constituency, and it is a very old plant, I have, to, I have to say. But it can still work. And what's happening is for this year, they have a team of about 20 people who are in that plant. This is E.ON, making that plant safe for demolition, taking the stored energy out of springs and uh, many other mechanisms throughout that enormous plant, so that from early next year, they can be in the process of a contractor demolishing that plant. But we still have time. If we apply for that derogation, if we say to the European Union, we have this problem, we are running out of capacity because we haven't put the sensible plans in place for electricity we should have done. We used to have the most competitive electricity in the world, but we've messed the whole thing up on a totally cross-party basis. Can we therefore just keep these plants open for a few more years? And all I ask is that the parties in this coalition get together and go to the European Union cap in hand to the Commission, saying, please, can we keep these open for a few more years? Because it just might allow our constituents to have electricity that is a bit cheaper, because that old coal can be used rather than new gas for which the capital costs <coughs> will have to be paid, as well as the marginal costs of the, of the gas supply. And that might just help us get through this electricity crunch a bit more safely, particularly if the economy is growing strongly, and might actually do something to keep down the cost of electricity rather than seeing both parties, three parties, competing to drive it up while pretending that they are doing the opposite. So the House of Lords, the Labour Party, would like us to make it even worse by making even more of the coal plants close, even earlier. I would say make it a bit better by just trying to keep a few of those oldest coal plants open just for a bit longer to hold down electricity bills and keep the lights on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister. Well, with the leave of the House, Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker, I sense the House wants to come to a decision on this.